We're going to take you through the equipment, how to rig up the uh, European nymphing systems, and uh, get a little advice from Vladdy. First of all, rod. They probably have a nine foot rod, most people do. Yeah, uh, mostly they use nine foot, 9.6, 10 foot, you know, because some people, uh, they like longer rod. As like me, I use nine, I use 10, you know, but uh, some people like French guys use uh, uh, almost 12 feet rod because they present new technique, you know, with casting. And we're gonna learn some of that technique too. Line. You use a floating line, right? Yeah, always floating line. Double tapered or weight forward? Uh, weight forward, you know, oh. that's, that's, the, that's the main line. Uh, you, cannot, you, can, you, you can use also a sinking line, but it's... Uh, no point, heavy, really. No point, because it's uh, uh, very uh, not good to cast me with those lines. Understand, you're not going to have a lot of line out, so the line is really not much of a factor. It's how you rig this leader up. And that's what we're going to talk about. First of all, I noticed that you have your leader butt section. Yeah. And it's kind of unique. Yes. Maybe, maybe such this. Because, you know, this I use like connector to, to, to the other leaders, you know. And then I'm going to use some kind of monofill, color monofill. Mm -hmm. Because right there. like me, Old man, I must see a little bit better, <laughs> like before. <laughs> so much of this technique has to do with all the senses, both visual, of course, right? Visual. Right. Then maybe what's in your mind, of course. But one of the most important, is feel, feeling the fly line. Next. Next. The whole leader. Now, whole leader. what about length? About length, I use like from my hand to to my neck here. Mm -hmm. That's about I don't know really. In a about feet. three feet. Three feet around three feet, and then then coming dropper. Now dropper. The first question you're gonna say why a dropper? Well, the technique that this system uses is actually pulling the fly, and the dropper becomes two aspects, a way to change flies quickly, but also the way that they're pulled through the water. So when you put on a dropper, one of the most uh, popular ways is to do a blood knot and let the ear of the blood knot hang out. That's not what you want to do here. We're going to show you how to tie a perfection loop set up, and this is probably one of the hardest things for people to understand, blood knots whether you use a surge knot, it's a knot. These leaders are sectioned, and they're sectioned for a reason, to keep the flies separated. Now, in world fly fishing competition, you use multiple flies, don't you? Yeah. And why do you use multiple flies? Uh, you know, uh, in, in a competition, you can use three flies. Mm -hmm. But mostly, I fish with two flies, because, you know, uh, three flies sometimes are more complicated. They twist, you know, but uh, in a competition, uh, the dropper cannot uh, cannot move. Mm -hmm. It can't yes. slide, so it has can to be slide. attached. Has to be attached. Now, but now you notice this is sliding. When we talk about yeah. this dropper, this this is put on with a perfection loop. But the beautiful thing about this is easy to take off when you have to change flies. Right. Now distances. Now I notice that this is probably about. Uh, Oh, I would say 10 to 12 inches. How short would you make these? Is there any kind you of know, formula? Yeah, if, if I fish uh, deep water, I can uh, I put always a longer dropper. If I fish uh, shallow water, can be like this too. You know, it's much easier to cast. You, you cannot hang it, you know, the dropper mm -hmm. between stones sometimes if you fish, uh, you know, shallow water. And another aspect, too, is if you hook this on something, you can break this off and not lose your whole rig. Yeah, that's that's really another, of course, aspect of multiple rigs. Another thing is I think it's important when we talk about having this perfection loop and how it slides, is it a, the ability to do this, 
right? It can rotate. Yeah. See how that rotates around? And that keeps the tangles to a minimum. Now, the first thing you're going to say, oh boy, I'm going to tangle a lot. That's probably one of the drawbacks of the system. You are going to tangle. But everybody who's fly fish knows that tangles are part of fishing. All right, now, this is probably going to be the key element to this whole system. And uh, I know that you know this English word, anchor. Anchor. What is it in Polish? Ciężarek. Uh, what everybody? place and people were writing me off. All my competitors, European competitors, were shaking my hand, patting me on the back and saying, Jeff, you did a great job, uh, but you're going to the lake, so you're probably going to get blanked and drop into 20th place. But boy, we really think that you did well, blah, blah, blah. Well, that was the last thing you tell Curry because it, it gets me fired up. And <laughs> the funny thing is I had crawled all morning to get those five fish to be in third place, and I was soaking wet. The weather changed. I mean, it dropped down into the 40s. I was soaking wet, I was shivering. I remember the bus got to the lake. It was a huge thunderstorm, it was blowing hard. And here we are, uh, the lake beat is one where you stand on the shore and I'm going to the worst part of the lake. I was borderline hyperthermia and along comes Vladi and Ed Oppler. And Vladi pulls the sweater off his back. It was a beautiful Polish sweater, I might add. I love these things. Throws it on me and at least I was gonna be warm enough to fish for three hours. And uh, Ed Oppler had an eight weight rod with a bunch of sinking lines. He's like, here you go, Jeff, we brought this because you're gonna need it. And I said, Ed, put that stuff away. I'm using my four weight and dry flies. And he looked at me like my hair was on fire, but everybody had been using sinking lines and it had been eight fish caught in the entire tournament. I'm not gonna do that. I knew my beat. There were white caps on the lake, but something I had learned years ago in Australia, that doesn't mean fish aren't gonna be looking up if there's bugs in the water. Uh, I set up on my beat. I knew I had to catch a fish to get a medal. I thought maybe I even had to catch two, but I actually put on my favorite fly here at home, a thorax mahogany dun, and I threw it out there in some of the glassy spots right on the edge of a point that was in my beat. The white caps were a foot away. My fly sat in this little glassy spot, and I sat on a rock like I was bait fishing and watched my fly, only 10, 15 feet from shore, did not make a long cast, and sat there and stared at it. Funny thing, Ed Oppler, Vladi, and my judge were all sitting up there. They were chatting like I was crazy. And 14 minutes into the three, three hour session, I just saw something take my fly. I just saw it disappear and I just went, bing. I had a fish on, I could not believe it. Didn't fight it, there was no fighting. Strip, 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 in the net. I looked in the net and I had a nine and three quarter inch brown trout. Doesn't sound like much, but somehow I knew that fish would put me over the top. And Everybody came running down, up and down. It was funny. I'm like, come down, calm. It's only 14 minutes. I have a chance to catch more fish. I don't want to spook any others. They came down, measure, measured the fish, and I mean, I let out a cheer like I've never never done before. It's almost kind of funny when I look back at it. I'm sure all the other contestants around the lake were like, oh no, Courier caught a fish. But most important fish I've ever caught in my life. The bronze medal for Mr. Jeff Courier of the United States. Congratulations to Jeff. I hope my fly box felt like I was going to put a dry fly on, and I did. And uh, within 14 minutes, I landed fish on a beat that only produced one fish through the whole tournament. So it was a miracle. I'll take it. I was pretty psyched. Well, I think this medal is going to help, you know, getting a third place and this is going to bring some attention to the team, maybe some better sponsorship, and of course then that will lead to uh, having a be better team. And this year we made a huge step. As a team, we got eighth place, and that's top ten is hard to do in this, you know, especially when you're in Europe competing against the Europeans. Let's join Jeff now in Spain as he talks himself through a practice session of European nymphing. And when I say anchor, we're talking tungsten beadhead, extremely heavily leaded hook. I still got my two flies on. I switched my upper fly to a tungsten beadhead nymph. Tungsten is very heavy, as most people know. So I've got two tungsten heads. We're going to leave Jeff now and come back with some tips from him a little later on in the DVD. But what I want to do first is take you through the basics of European nymphing. You're going to hear a dry land explanation of the nymphing from Vladi himself. 
Then we'll go right into the instruction of the three basic types of European nymphing. So let's get started. A relatively good time to, to catch fish where the, uh, where the, the same uh, where the, uh, insects, you know, are going to surface. And then we, we uh, try and find a way to, to catch them. Of course, we uh, put some weight to the nymphs. And so it was very important because always uh, the insects uh, start from the bottom. And always when I cast with my uh, flies, I want to be always in the bottom first. And then I'm a little bit faster than, than current water, and I take off flies, you know, very quick from the water. And uh, the, this movement is, movement is very similar like, uh, like the insects live in the water. And, uh, uh, very important is speed. Uh, if you cast uh, with the nymphs, you can cast upstream and follow fly and uh, speed like one, you can't like one, two, three, and take off, you know, uh, uh, nymphs from the water. And in that time, this is the best, best time to catch fish because, you know, always, I think, maybe you are agreed with me, uh, the first S seconds, you know, one, two, three is the best for any kind of fish, you know, because sometimes fish, like in the very fast water, haven't time to see, you know, uh, very good. O only fish go like uh, fish have the natural reflex, you know, and they go to to something what move in the water. And uh, remember uh, that uh, like, remember the names or something like that. Uh, we fish with the heavy nymphs, with the indicator, like, like something like that. You know, if I am a little bit faster than the current, I feel every single stance in water. But uh, if fish took your fly, is something specific. You know, this is practice, cross years. But, but I can, I think the, the people can feel it this, uh, uh, to this immediately. Uh, where is the touch of fish, or, or, or where the when the nymphs are jumping, you know, in the bottom on the stones? Because of our use of indicators as floats, drifting the nymph and keeping them at a level has been effective. However, it is not nearly as effective, especially in fast water, as the European system, because it has some drawbacks. The first limitation from a strike indicator is that the nymph will be pushed forward of the indicator due to the increased current underneath the surface and with the current pushing the total leader forward. Because of this angle, a fish that is in the same plane feeding as the nymph will simply open his mouth and just the nymph long before the indicator will go down. For the indicator to work properly, the fish must see the fly above him, take the fly, then return to where he was feeding, thus pulling down the indicator. Watch this fish in its subtle take, watch his elevation in the water column, and then you determine whether you think he could pull an indicator down. The indicator will have to ride almost completely over the fish before you know there's any indication of a strike. Most of the time, the fish just lets go of the fly, as you see here. Watch this. Takes a fly. A second later, he spits it out. Not nearly enough time for you to know that it happened. In European nymphing, What's going to happen is the fish spots the nymph pulling for the water, takes the nymph, and you're immediately going to feel the strike and hook the fish. The next important basic will be the cast. If you could really call it a cast. It's uh, really no back cast. It's a rotation of the wrist. It's uh, very similar to a roll cast pickup. But what we're going to do 
is show you some of the key elements. And you'll agree after you've done it. There's an important uh, part of this cath that's going to make you more effective. I like to say it's a unsophisticated reach mend, except without the mend. To start the forward cast, you do the quick little hook set. And now you start by rotating your wrist and increasing power. The cast is a full stroke cast, rotating the wrist, turning the spine of the rod in the direction of the cast. This will cause the fly to land straight upstream without a belly. In slow motion, the hook set, now the rotation of the wrist, increasing the power, and at this point you can see where the position of the wrist is. Now the cast continues forth, increasing the power. Again, notice the position of the wrist. The cast will complete with the same wrist position, slightly turning the spine of the rod and keeping the fly line going straight with the tip of the rod upstream. Notice how straight the line is to the tip of the rod. This will improve your ability to feel the strike. When we put it all together, it looks like this in real time. The next step becomes the swinging of the fly and the position of the rod. Your rod position will determine how the fly moves and drifts and at what depth. Before we talk about rod position, I want you to understand the swinging or pulling of the fly. This has to be done in a smooth and direct position, moving the rod tip at the same plane downstream, as you see right here. This will become more apparent as we get further into the tape. First time European nymphing mistakes occur usually with the cast. The minute the fly hits, not pulling the fly immediately or moving the rod too quickly downstream. This will relate to a big belly in the line where the fly is actually going downstream with the current and not being pulled. This becomes very apparent in slow motion. A lot of it has to do with rod position and how fast and smooth the fly is pulled. Now Jeff Carrier has a great tip for beginning European nymphers. Here's a couple tips for me from fishing in Europe quite a bit. We'll call it the European Courier nymphing tips. I like to swim my flies, something that Vladi taught me, meaning that I throw them upstream instead of dead drifting like people do with an indicator, I slowly drag them along. Tick, 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 I feel it on the bottom. I know that tick, and if anything different, boom, I set the hook, okay? How do you know if you're pulling your flies the right speed? Spot something in the water. Maybe it's a leaf, maybe it's a bubble, and make your rod tip go slightly faster than that, and you know now you are swimming your flies along the bottom. The next thing to consider is the position of the rod during the swing. How high you should hold it, how close to the water, this will determine how your flies are pulled through the water. The higher the rod in slower moving water, the higher the flies are going to move uh, through the water column. My best tip is to go out in clear water that's moving that you can see depth and see what your rod does. See how the flies react. Put on some very brightly colored flies and watch the effect. But most often, just going out and fishing will help you determine this. Now let's take a look at some rod positions and the relationship to the fly. Now we're watching Vladdy with a higher rod in slowing moving water, letting the fly sink down and start bumping on the bottom. If he chose to move this rod a little faster would probably bring the flies up a little higher Again, raising his rod, moving the flies a little faster, would then have them catch the higher current and move the flies downstream away from the bottom. Learning to watch the line will tell you a lot about what your flies are doing. 
Right now, you see the flies bumping on the bottom, or at least what we call the anchor fly is bumping on the bottom. Again, Vladdy has adjusted his pull so that the flies will jump on the bottom. Now, I want you to watch right here as a line bumps the bottom and a fish takes it, but unfortunately, Vladdy misses him. Here it comes, the line bumping on the bottom. Now it goes tight as the fish takes the fly. The fish is lucky. This doesn't happen too often to Vladdy. Now let's have Jeff Courier tell us more about pulling the fly. Now when I say pulling the flies, I just want to make it clear. I'm not pulling the flies like a streamer or sweeping them along. What I'm doing is I'm pulling them just hard enough that number one, they look like they're swimming downstream, but more importantly, think about it, from the tip of my rod to my flies, if I'm pulling them, there's no belly in my leader. It's a literally straight connection to them. So if a fish takes my fly, I feel it. It's not like I have a big bellow in my leader and I have to wait for the fish to straighten that out before I feel them. I'm on top of it like that. As you watch this DVD, you're going to understand there'll be different ways of pulling the fly. But they all will have rhythmic movement, keeping the rod on the same plane, adjusting for river currents, and getting the feel that Jeff Courier talked about. This will be something you'll develop like golf. The more you do it, the more you're going to learn to feel the flies bumping on the bottom, the line tighten through your finger. This is an incredible technique, but it's going to take some work. Now watch Vladdy work backhanded on some heavy water. If you watch real carefully, you can see how the fly telegraphs that it's bouncing on the bottom. Coming up in just a moment is one of the most important parts. It's the anchor nymph, or in her case, kind of a strike indicator in reverse. Understanding the anchor nymph fly is the key to European nymphing. There is no split shots on the leader to cause drag. All the weight is in the fly. So the anchor nymph is your weight. It can bump on the bottom, it can be above the bottom, but most important it provides the weight to hold the fly in the current and track. Picking an anchor nymph is just as intricate as picking the right dry fly. As you can see, this is a box of European style flies. On the left side here, we're looking at anchor nymphs in a variety of different styles, from worms to caddis flies to heavy stone flies to mayflies. Most often, the anchor fly will be attached to the end of your tippet, or what we call the point fly. By casting the dropper fly upstream, it will sink to the bottom, pulling the dropper fly and the anchor fly to the bottom. Notice how the bend of the hook bumps against the rocks, not with the point but the bend, like in a clouser minnow. Both the design of the fly and the pulling of the fly will create this. Then further up the leader will be what we call the dropper fly, attached through a system of using a loop that will then slide down to a knot. To attach the dropper, we tie a double perfection knot. And then with our length of our dropper, whatever we decide decided to be, we'll go through the loop. The loop will then be slid down to the leader above the knot. And then we'll attach our dropper fly. All this will be shown to you throughout this DVD, including the knots. The dropper flies shown on the right hand side of this box have their own characteristics. Many of them, of course, are the European style nymphs, which are many times woven like in the Czechs and the Polish nymphs. Other times there are a variety of caddis, mayfly, and stonefly patterns. Notice that most of them are beadheads. 
once the dropper is attached, it can spin around on the leader, keeping it from twisting. The fly is cast. The anchor fly immediately goes to the bottom, and the dropper fly is visible. As the rod moves the flies downstream, the dropper fly bounces on the bottom. As it bounces on the bottom, it telegraphs information back up to the angler as he's moving the rod. He's watching the rod, he's feeling the movement through the line, and suddenly the line goes tight as the fish scoops up the anchor fly. He immediately feels the tightening of the line and the fish is on, as you can see here. And I followed the fly, follow the fly, and back immediately with the flies, you know. And every touch and every single, you know, jump on the stones, I feel very well. But what I said before, what I said before, the, the if fish, you know, take your fly, is something specific. It's not like jumping on stones, you know. But that is a year of practice. Are you know? you feel yeah. Through your fingers? I, I make like this, you know, yeah. always. Let, let me get, and let the me get right first moment, first moment, if, uh, if you know, uh, of course, when I pull or strike, if fish take my fly, you know, this loop helped me a lot because, you know, it's something heavier on the end. And then, you know, this, this first, first movement, you know, the, when fish take, uh, take the fly, help me a lot here with this loop here because it's not that stiff, you know, like this. Only it's a little bit loose here, you know. Now let's look at the dropper fly as it drifts. The fish spots it, moves over, takes it, the line goes tight, and the fish is on. Notice that he is pulling the anchor fly. Good idea to have a lighter tippet on the anchor fly when you hook a fish on the dropper. Uh, this way you can lose the dropper rather than the fish. One of the most important factors about this system is where the fly hooks the fish. Almost all of them will be on the roof of the mouth. Uh, this is an exciting way. It's easy to release the fish. Again, proves the great contact you have with this system.